faculty, staff, chairman of the board, and uh, all of my colleagues and friends who are here. Uh, you know, it's a humbling experience for you to sit down and hear all these folks talk about all the things you've done. Uh, let me make it clear, uh, this wasn't about me. It was really about taking Catherine Drexel's mission and trying to spread it further than we ever thought we'd go. So I will say I thank Georgetown for this award, but I take it in the name of all of the people whom I have served with and those who mentored me in my growth, uh, in my you probably figured out how old I was. <laughs> In my 70, 74 years, 84. <laughs> now, when I listen to the bios, I've heard this before. Uh, I start with this. Let me tell you who I really am. I was born in a small town. I lived 34 years of my life even after law school, in this totally segregated society. I couldn't walk into a restaurant or a theater anywhere in the South, maybe some parts of the North as well, until I was really almost 50 years of age. My father and my mother did not graduate from high school, but I learned, and excuse me, I'm going to say something faculty. I learned more from them than I could ever have learned if I had gone to Xavier, Georgetown, and the like. They were as smart as any person I have met in my long history because they taught me the fundamentals of how you should live a life, respect yourself, respect other people, and keep your head up even when people were talking bad about you and not letting you do the kind of things you were entitled to do. That was the foundation. And I, I should say, I have a number of connections with Georgetown. Uh, as you have already heard, uh, my brother was the fourth black Catholic bishop named in the United States. And so we have a connection with the Haley brothers <laughs> of African descent. Only twice in the history of the United States has there been uh, a brother who was a bishop and a president who was an African-American in the university, a Catholic university. My brother Joe Francis and I, in 1976, joined the Healy Brothers with that distinction. Mm -hmm. that distinction. The president told me I could talk as long as I wanted to talk. <laughs> and I thought tonight Georgetown was playing uh, big basketball game, so I figured we'd get out of here in a hurry and go watch the game. But since there's not a game, <laughs> uh, I will take some time because there are a few things I want to say. Uh, first of all, uh, I've said this a number of times when I've been in, in events. I know I had a good speech when I walked in here because everybody has used it. <laughs> I need the time to say some other things. And, and let, let me start. First of all, as I exit uh, higher education after all of these years, it's about 60 years to be exact from the time that I entered Xavier in 48. I have never been more concerned about my country as I am today. And it's a tough statement to make. And I want to make it clear that we've done a lot of great things in this country, many great things for which we are proud, some of which, of course, we were not proud. But as I explained to you earlier, I never lost faith in my country. I never lost faith even when I was not being treated like my friends and all who grew up in this small town uh, as a non-American, so to speak. But I am concerned as I leave, as I say, because we have not finished the promise of America for all Americans. I want to repeat that. For all Americans. Yes, 
particularly African Americans, Hispanics, and minorities. But somehow this country seems to believe that when we talk about helping people, they talk about African Americans as if it's an African American problem. It is not. It is an American problem. Mm -hmm. Race, creed, color, and gender still matter in this country. This is not a racist statement. It only says it matters. And we don't deal with it. We deal with it. We ignore it at our risk. And today, if I say nothing else, what I want to say, and I'll say a few other things, uh, I'm saying to higher education, you are going to be the conscience of this country. You are going to be the conscience of this country. I'm worried about the fact that we have forgotten the number of people who do not have, will not have, unless we do something about it. The playing field isn't equal. If you believe that, I've got some land in New Orleans I want to say. <laughs> and you choose any one of the quality of life issues health care, employment, housing, poverty, and particularly the poverty of children. I hate to admit it, but the report just came in and said my own uh, city is number 39 in the country with poor children. And of course, education. And education is, is and always will be the pathway out of poverty, out of poverty. And yet, we have not all understood how important this is when we were founded on education. And I'm pleading to you and I, whenever I've gotten a chance, I plead that we are at risk if we do not address the quality of life issues in this country. And make it, make it very clear, Mr. Francis, we're not talking about providing, quote, equal distribution of largesse, if you want to call it that, to unequal circumstances. If the playing field is not equal, and it is not equal, if you pour equal amounts of water in unequal glasses, the glasses remain unequal. I'll repeat that. You pour equal amounts of water in unequal glasses, the glasses remain unequal. How do you have to pour the water if those glasses are? You have to pour them equitably. There's a difference between equal and equitably. And we need to tell people in high places there is a difference. So we need to provide for those who need more what they need in order for this country to remain, to remain a great country. I was with your president at a meeting in New York with the 100 top research institutions in the country. And as I listened to all of you, I thought I was back in a meeting with the HBCU presidents. They were, they were talking about how little money that's being offered, and it's true, <laughs> to research institutions to keep this nation where it once was, getting back to being number one. Now, I have to say something about that system I just called HBCUs. Uh, we are one of the young colleges in the system. It's been around for 1855. And from the first day.